Here we are on Selection Radio. For those who don't know, this song behind us right now is uh, Mayor Hawthorne. This is when he used to go by um, Haircut and when yep. he made beats and he was banging it out. Every now and then, um, you know, I really get guests on the show who are really just like insp- who who have really inspired this the selection sound um inspired me personally coming up i've been doing this for about i don't know eight nine years already and um man this, this is it's an honor to have you here peanut butter wolf um head of stone's throw and uh we used to be neighbors as well i don't know if he really knows that but um, yeah welcome bro yeah man how good to you? see you yeah man good to see you it's it's crazy the way this linked up shout out to my producer ian for reaching out yeah um but um yeah man how have you been no i've been good man um yeah no complaints just looking at that jazzy sport shirt <laughs> you know you went out to japan so yeah just got to hear about that <laughs> yeah i mean honest, i'll interview you yeah interview me right let, let the tables turn my, my trip to japan was very inspiring yeah. um from from the, the architecture to the music the culture, the fashion, the yeah. food, everything about it, I was overwhelming. Every step I took, I caught myself wanting to take photos of everything. But I, I had yeah. to find that balance of knowing when to put my phone down, my cameras down, and just enjoy the setting around me, you know? Right, right, right. But it's I've traveled to a lot of places, and that's definitely like my top two in the world that I've been to. I know, I see you all over the place, so congrats <laughs> on that, man. Thank you, man. And, and likewise, uh, what, what's what been your favorite place to visit and, and, and why? I mean, Tokyo definitely is always up there. Um, I remember I brought my girl there, and then I was like, isn't this, like, bucket list for you, like, top three? And she was like, "Mm, I never thought about it, but not really. And then after, she was like, oh, this was the best. I had no idea. So, yeah. But we're talking about me, though, not her, right? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I love Tokyo. No, I mean, I was just in South Africa, where I think you were at before I was. Yeah, Cape Town. Yeah, so that was Did you go to uh, Johannesburg? I did, yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's it's cool that music can, you know, take us places we'd never go otherwise. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, Yeah. Real quick, going back to Japan, Stone's Throw, and and you're a firm believer of putting out physical merch. What I love about Japan is that they're, you know, everything is still physical. Oh, yeah. CDs and vinyl yeah. is so, so important. Yeah. And uh, that's what I know. It's it's a big, it's a big, like, world for you with the, with the vinyl. Like, you guys, every, it is. Every, every record you guys put out, there's vinyl or a CD put out with it. And that's that's what I love about Stone's Throw is that there's still that physical, you know, tangible product or art piece that you can still get. You know? Yeah, I've been stubborn about it because I think, <laughs> like, when I started Stone's Throw, I mean, this was in the 90s, and it was... Um, it was only vinyl we didn't do any like i mean we didn't do cds it was really a, a label for djs i guess and then record collectors but you know it was before itunes or anything so it was yeah a different world yeah it's it's amazing because you've gone through so many decades and, and you've seen the 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 eras of music change and how people receive music and how they interact with it so that's that's been amazing how much how many uh how much vinyl do you own now at this point like currently at this yeah um I don't. I mean, it's all like in one place now, so that's cool. I actually thinned out my collection uh, after my last move, so <laughs> I got rid of like a third of my records. But, wow! Um, Did you sell them or you gave them away? No, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll just buy records without knowing what it is, just by the, the cover, and then sometimes it doesn't work out. So I just, you know, I, I took all those records side. and put them in boxes. Yeah, because yeah. it gets to the point like. I don't really like organizing my records. Like someone like J Rock, he has it alphabetical, and like most most people have it either that way or by yeah. genres. And then lately, it's just I just kind of have it as a free for all. But yeah. then it obviously it makes it way harder to find what I'm looking for. But. Yeah. So if if you let's say you buy 20 records, you go to Japan or you go to Cape Town and you find a record shop, do you listen to all of them on the spot? Or you go buy artwork and or and you listen to a few, and then when you get home, you kind of go through them. Kind of both. I mean, yeah. Usually I, I'll listen because like. I don't really have the liberty to like carry as much stuff, I guess, when I'm traveling. So I'll, uh, yeah, Got it you. won't be as much like taking chances. But someone like Madlib, he like he buys. I mean, for every record I have, he owns like ten records. Like that's that's the guy that I personally that I know who has probably the biggest record the collection. The biggest collection. And like just all over the place. Yeah, man, I have so many questions about Madlib and just what it's been like uh, when you first found him and and working with him. But a, a little background. Uh, so, you know, Stone Store offices in Highland Park. Yeah. We're, you know, the, the selection HQ used to be in this really small shoebox room. Used to be about like four or five of us just slammed in there. Right. It was like a sweat box. And um, ironically, um, Madlib at the time, he was, was he right was next right, right next door. And 
his entrance used to go the, the way he walked in was through the other side he never came in from our front entrance because oh, he, yeah. he pretty much had the whole floor of the building he does yeah and does. um shout yeah. out to eric coleman for for being the one who kind of like got us in there and it was just crazy because he would be on tour and yet there yeah. would still be music playing so oh, it, wow. it was almost like you're like wait is madlib here yeah, it, was, it was like his energy or his soul was still there i could have swore a few times i heard someone playing the drums or something and i know he was very private yeah yeah you know but um he's always to, to us he was just like the godfather like the phantom you never really knew yeah. when he was there and if he was he I, I probably only saw him twice in like three years that i was there yeah and, exactly um, that's kind of how it is i but, mean when we were roommates i would never see him even <laughs> really well no that's not true yeah but. But, but just his, his work ethic, you know, and, and just to know yeah. like, he, he has this mysterious, you know, vibe to him. And, and I, I just love that because you could never put point a finger on like what he was doing. Right, exactly. And then all of a sudden you just see like, you know, 10 releases out through Stone's Throw in the course of like six months. You know, the medicine show and all those little things. Right, right. Know? Yeah. So I mean, yeah, I mean, he's always in the studio um, as, as long as I've known him. That's how he's been. So. Who would you say, in from all the artists that you brought on to Stone Stone, giving them a platform, who do you consider the face of Stone Throw? Um, I mean, well, Madlib is definitely one of the the bigger faces I think um, that that I think of, like when I think of Stone Throw. But yeah, I mean, it's been a long time, so there's there's just a lot of people. I mean, there's like the era with him and Dilla and Doom, and then there's like you know Dame Funk and Mayor so Hawthorne we were Hawthorne. talking about earlier, yep. and then. I mean, there's Jaunty and like kind of the new, the newer the new artists wave, and stuff too. We have too. like Knowledge and all those guys. Yeah, of course, Knowledge and Anderson Pack. And yeah, yeah, we'll we'll talk about them. Um, is there one song that you want to get into right now? We're actually gonna hear a set from you later, which I'm really excited to hear because I know you have some unreleased for us and what's forthcoming for the rest of the year. But is there any um any song, uh, from any of those artists? Whether, whether what's like your favorite Mad Lib song? That's like at the top of something you could think of oh man you know I, I have all these unreleased tracks that i've been listening to lately but um those beat tapes those floppy well discs, that and uh, well all the old like loop pack era stuff like for i mean that he had albums with kazi and declaim and med and oh no like all those those guys we that should get into never some quasi or some like unseen. yeah god's gift like god's gift is one of my favorite rappers that like he got really into the church so he just stopped rapping and then now he's kind of back at it but you know yeah well maybe we should get into to one of those tracks right now here on selection radio here with peanut butter wolf stones throw uh keep it locked don't go nowhere and we're back um during our break right now we were actually discussing the you know just the artists that you've you've worked with and that you brought on to stones throw all you know you deal with so many personalities and, and i can relate to you with selection because the artists and, and the djs and, and just all the personalities that i've discovered and yeah. and have worked with uh, you know, you meet them, you find them on the internet, or you meet them through someone on the crew. It's like a reference, and sometimes you don't know. You know, you hear their music and you're amazed, but then their personality. A lot of them are introverts, or they're right. they're antisocial, and yeah. you don't kind of learn that until along the way. You know, the music is what connected everybody, but then you know sometimes it's a positive or it's a negative. How, how have you been able to deal with that and just kind of balancing that out? You know, and, and keeping it about the music. I think, I mean, I, I just learned to, like, give people their space and stuff. Like, I'm, I'm even, like, hanging out with Dilla, like, you know, that, that whole Geek Down episode where a, a, a beat maker was, like, talking to Dilla too much, and then he changed his answering machine and stuff. And, like, <laughs> so I would never, like, call Dilla, really, basically. But then if he called me, like, whatever I was doing, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm not doing anything today. Like, if he called to, like, go record shopping and, and I had a dentist appointment, I'd be like, oh, no, I'm free today. Yeah, I don't nothing. But, you know, just... Um, it's just that kind of stuff, I guess, like with the, yeah, yeah, speaking down when you have to. Yeah, no, I, pr I really appreciate that because, but well, actually, what was your favorite, what's like your most memorable Dilla story? Um, hmm. I think, well, we were really, Malcolm and I were really excited when we first went out to Detroit to work on you know what ended up being Jayla, but at the time it was really like just the two of them collaborating and i just remember getting picked up and you know because we we knew each other i mean i had known D dilla for maybe five or six years before that but just to like 
hang out. He picked us up in the delay, took us to the strip club, and you know all that stuff. <laughs> it was just like a reality. I think more you, you saw him as a person and not like this guy that you don't know anything about really. Yeah. And was was House Shoes the one who who kind of like connected some of that? Or he was. Yeah. Got Shoes it. was like the first person who I found out about Dilla through. Like, wow. um, I used to work at a record distributor in the mid '90s, and then Shoes was at a record store. And actually, was at Fat Beats, yeah. No, no, it was uh, I forget. It was in Detroit though. It was a it was a record store in Detroit, and I put out a record called Peanut Butter Breaks, which was like one of my first records of my own productions. Yeah. And he called me about that, and um, he was like, "Oh, I got this guy JD who makes beats too, and like you got to hear him, and you know." So, and then we put out a, a remix record of all JD stuff, like Dilla, myself, and uh, Shoes together. So that was like in '97, I think, and we sold them only in Japan, like. We didn't want to sell them in the U.S. like to because we didn't want Dilla to get in trouble with uh, the major labels that he was remixing artists from. Ah. So, so he would work with like, you know, D'Angelo or Mad Skills or whoever it was, yeah. and um, the the remixes all got shelved. So yeah. basically, yeah. Looking back at it now, because I feel it wasn't you know for a lot of the the younger generation, even though. Even people like myself, I was listening to Dilla all along through Common, through yeah, D'Angelo, exactly. and you know, so forth. Tribe. Like Janet, yeah, Tribe. Yeah. You didn't really know until, you know, after he passed away. Then you kind of go back. And as I got more mature to understand the, the whole, like, composer side and the credits and that the, yeah. the producer is, is a true one behind the record. Then I realized, like, oh, man, like, Dilla was behind all of this all along. Yeah. Um, did you know at at that moment that like how how legendary he already was or what it wasn't so like you look back at all his body of work as well like you know i feel like i, I mean i knew early on like because q-tip was his manager and q-tip was hooking him up oh, with everybody yeah so he hooked Whoa. him up with farside and like you know all the artists that you mentioned that's and um, erica badu and all that that's that's kind of how i think in buster rhymes that's kind of how he got his start like being even though he was sure, in man. detroit and like yeah. you know quiet he wasn't like out there like you know so, so you're telling me that, as man, that's unheard of to someone as big as Q-Tip and in the prime of Tribe Called Tribe yeah. Called Quest. He so recognized he, he, it. He, he was his manager. He realized that talent right away, and he wanted to be a part of it. I think, and that was like wow. the Uma was, you know, him and Ali Shaheed. And that's that's rare. You never you never hear of like a, an artist on that level, right? You know, uh, manage like someone like like that's crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. Cool. That, that tells so me a lot. Were, that Q-Tip is a very uh, Balanced and organized guy, person. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. No, he he has an ear and stuff. That's crazy. Um, we were talking. You were also mentioning remixes and 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 kind of like the direction on why you guys drop things in Japan. How, yeah. How has it been? Because Stone's Throw primarily drops a lot of you know a lot of soul, a lot of funk. Yeah. And a lot Absolutely. of the music has samples in it. How how have you guys gone? I've always been curious as well. Like when it comes to sample clearances, how how do you go about that? Um, I mean, when we know what it is and we'll contact the person like, um, like the No Worries, for example, the, the single was a sample from Gil Scott Heron and, yeah. and we dealt with, um, his kids cause he had passed away and wow. his kids, um, granted the license for it and stuff. You know, we worked out ahead of time. Sometimes the artists don't remember what they sample or, <laughs> you know, you just like go through records and yeah. stuff. So. Um, we deal with stuff after the fact too. Sometimes people come after us. I mean, that whosample.com is like made it. I mean, you can see what everything. You know. Yeah, and it's it's funny because I use that site so much. To, I do to too get, to get to the core of things. But yeah, that that's an um that's a. But crazy, as a label, we're like, ah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like your worst enemy sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So well, that's cool that that you guys have the relationship. But sometimes that can delay the record, maybe like six months to a year by time. They'll peep those people get to it and hear it and then clear it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times songs just get scrapped too. And then like uh, with j -Lib, like there was a song where they sampled from uh, a militant feminist woman and some of the lyrics she didn't agree with. So we had oh, to take wow. the track off and then, but we were able to use the instrumental version or something. Crazy. Just well, didn't want, yeah. You know, I, I was talking or I had heard a story through through Katranata, um, or it was, it was someone, I think it was Katra. Yeah. And they just had, I remember he had Bad, Bad, Not Good. There was a sample that couldn't be cleared. Right. And I think they just had Bad, Bad, Not Good just replay, replay it. it. And yeah. I think that's another, I've heard that so much recently. Uh, people just replaying records in order to, uh, you know, kind of just. To not know, have to deal with yeah, that. To yeah. Yeah. Because sometimes. Out of the situation. Right. 
I mean, sometimes some people get really extra greedy with it. I mean, everybody's different, you know, with that situation. But like Stevie Wonder, for example, like, you know, we did a album of Mad Lib doing all Stevie Wonder covers. And I met Stevie and like he was like really cool about everything. So where let's get into um, some Dilla. <laughs> no, it feels right, man. I mean, he's been playing in the background, but, you know, I always got to play a dealer track. So let's get into some JD, um, some old, like, beat tape, like, 95, 96, far side vibe. So we'll go. get into that, and we'll be right back here with PB Wolf. Keep it locked. Yeah, behind us right now, Twami. I really like this guy. And this compilation that you guys recently put out, Sophie's SOS oh, yeah. Tape, there's so much heat on here. Yeah, like, yeah. I was impressed, like, the way she curated that. And, and yeah. I think it's amazing because uh, I know she was, was she interning or working for, with you guys? She interned and then she worked for us, yeah. And then she went, she was at Boiler Room she for a while. She was at Boiler Room for a minute, yeah, yeah. And I think that's so tight how you gave her, you know, like an employee, essentially, you know, a, an opportunity Obviously, she has a music, a great musical, you know, yeah, taste yeah. in mind. But like the fact you gave her a chance to like put that together, I think that's that's kind of unheard of. I think that's tight. I mean, yeah, that was after she left Stone Star. We, we, you know, remained friends for a while and stuff. And then, uh, yeah, I was just like, you should do a compilation and stuff. Yeah, with all your, you know, label head to label head, because I, man, I, I'm, I'm a, I'm studying like a lot right now when I travel when yeah. I talk to people when I, like when I talked to Giles Peterson months ago I, yeah. I was really asking him a lot of like radio questions and just how he did it when you know you DJ you travel you run a business you have your personal life how do you find the balance of of you know doing all of that and also finding these artists and, and making time because it's hard to do all of that you know and juggle all that it is yeah I mean I don't travel like all that much anymore like I you know I but I do enjoy it and stuff still so like but as far as like I haven't been to Europe like in a couple of years like, oh wow you know, but I still yeah I mean I basically do Japan and Australia and then spot dates around the US but um I mean it's just yeah just switching gears and stuff it, it actually it keeps my life more interesting if I was just doing the label full-time or if I was just DJing full-time I, I would get bored with it so True. I like having the, the double career thing yeah but even like when you were at your core and and, and really traveling frequently yeah. yeah i mean if you when i think about when i was in high school um you know from 2004 to through 2007 right uh you know that was a a time where i started to become familiar with stone's throw yeah and it was you know it was mad villain it yeah. was dilla the j lip stuff the quasi yeah. um all those record dame funk the baron zen that's what that's how i discovered you know what and the the mm -hmm. loop pack that's how i discovered stone's throw and i feel like that was like one of the prime aloe black seeing the south by southwest you know chrome oh, children's yeah. 2006 that's when i feel like you're and I, and I know you were doing tours so how, how were you keeping these artists like you know saying and on schedule you know at the time yeah um well i mean i always had a gm that was doing like the day-to-day -day stuff too so right. even like when i'm uh, in LA I'm not like in the office every day or anything I'll, I'll go you know when when I can and stuff got but, it but yeah I mean now that we have our studio in our office too so that makes it like more interesting for me to go to the office and, yeah know, I, and stay I creative just, just yeah stay the in the studio yeah exactly I think that's amazing well you brought yeah. up a good point having your GM because no matter how talented you are or how much of the brain you are to your your empire your platform you do need a team yeah you know? and, that, and that's what i've realized as well is like i can't do it all myself yeah absolutely and i think that's cool how you're able to delegate uh that time that energy that work to others and step back because i know when you do it all yourself for so long you know you're just you're such a perfectionist and you do things a certain way but yeah. then seeing someone else do it and get recognition credit could be tough in the beginning but it's like it, it has a great payoff in the long run because you right. need a team that's I mean, I, I'm more, yeah, I've always been, like, more creative than, um, like, business-minded. I mean, I, my, I got a degree in business. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I did that, but, yeah, I, feel you. But, um, yeah, I never was, like, organized enough. I had the, like, the super ADHD thing, I think. So, yeah, uh, that's why, like, if I was trying to run the label on my own, I mean, I did the, the first, like, three or five years yep. or something but and i feel you and that's how it was but i think too. it grew like yeah when i was able to have other people involved yeah well, what's also cool is that um you know selection we're more of a producer heavy you know collective label dj yeah but what i love is that stone is really about 
it's about the producer but it's really been about like you guys have thrived as a with vocalists you know yeah. rappers and singers yeah um Bands. and i think that's cool yeah. what what's been your formula going back to you know keeping that balance with the artist it's really hard to sign an artist as a as a even yeah. if you have your gm like yeah you, you gotta think about it like it's not everybody but a lot of them you have to get to know them because it has to be a yeah. good fit especially as an indie label you have to go with you know go with them to the studio kind of get to know yeah. them um you know go eat with them try if they're in another state or city or country you got to go at least meet them once you know and yeah ha has that been tough like in, in over the years it seems easier now because like yeah i've done it for a long time and now i know like who i click with and who i don't and then there's some, some people like if i don't feel like i'm clicking then uh, you know, I don't have to sign everybody. Like, yeah. I can be a fan and not not work That's with real. somebody. You know. That's cool. So, and you guys just hit twenty years. Uh, your yeah. twenty year anniversary last year. Yeah. Right. How how has that been? Like, from where you were, from year one to year five, decade in, and now twenty years. Like, what's the motive now? Uh, I think it's the same. I mean, it's just discovering new talent and um, just you know keeping it fun not like not mundane or whatever so like um i mean i yeah even the, like the past year i feel like we have a, a a lot of new people that i'm excited to it's like when i sign younger artists i'm like going on their journey now i'm like looking at the world through their eyes and yeah. like you know it keeps me like oh sudan archives has never left the united <laughs> states yet and now, now she just went and did a music video in africa wow. you know in ghana and um just hearing their stories and stuff you know yeah that's amazing giving these artists that opportunity you know we were talking about you know Madlib being one of the, the faces who do you consider like the baton being passed over to now in, in, in terms of these newer artists that you've been picking up who's someone that you really yeah really I mean see? it's not there's not really like gonna be well everybody's so different you know so yeah. I mean I, I really love Mild High Club right now like what he's been doing is like incredible but it's not you know, it's totally different than what Mad Lib or really different than it, what the legacy of Stone Star has been built on. So that's just one example. But I just mentioned Sudan and, you know, I love her stuff. Like John T just finished his second album and it, he's grown a lot from his first album, in my opinion. But um, there's, yeah, there's just a lot of artists. A lot of artists. Yeah. You have, you've had, you've worked with so many different people. I can't even keep up. Let's get into a quick break. Um, still a few more things that I, I feel like we can talk for about three, four hours here. <laughs> hey. But we're going to keep it sharp nah, here. here on Selection Radio. Here with PB Wolf. Keep it locked. Kind of Thundercat. This is just like some clip that I got from uh, Looking for the Perfect Beat documentary. Was there ever a point where uh, you were you ever going to bring Flying Lotus onto Stone's Throw? I was always curious about that. Yeah, you know, it's funny is he, um, he interned for us like, years ago like before yeah he had anything out and stuff and when he was showing me his music i liked it but i, I felt like it sounded too much like dilla and madlib mm -hmm. at the time yeah. and then i was like well i already have dilla madlib so like, <laughs> you can't get no then, better than that but but then like to his credit like he like found his own sound later and you know it was like kind of like a mild regret that i didn't sign him like looking <laughs> back but like i I'm, I'm still like very happy with who i work with so. of course and it's you know he has his own label and he's yeah. putting out people like thundercat, thundercat and like, <laughs> yeah uh, yeah it, it's so. all a close circle man and, and it's still a family it's still a network and yeah brain feeder, oh, absolutely yeah 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 brain feeder i feel like the our our scene when i when i think of los angeles you think stone throw um you think brain feeder you think yep. about selection. Uh, selection. <laughs> you think about low end theory. Yeah. Um. A lot of those. These, sure. Yeah. It's 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 a great culture, man. And what's crazy is that we live in such a huge city. You know, if, even if you add, you know, the Orange County and mm -hmm. and, and I E all, all these different places, there's what thirteen to twenty million people, and and that's a lot. And yeah. we we have to do a lot to stand out. But yeah, it's been cool to see people like I feel like Thundercats really thriving you know individually i, know. I love and, his stuff yeah and it's cool to see you know i grew up too like in early in the beat scene going to low end and i seen you know mind design and, I, and you know i yeah. saw um you know knowledge and, and to see them have a hub you know john wayne see them have a yeah. hub with you it's it's really cool and you were saying fly low you know he was an intern what's funny is when i was um i just i just graduated from high school i actually applied 
two stones throw. Oh wow! And um, I'm sure like the volume was just so crazy of yeah. people, like so many people. And I never heard back. And that was honestly the moment that inspired me because Selection wasn't started yet. Right. That was 2007. That was a moment You're where like, I realized I need to start my own thing because I'm like, cool. yo, I can't wait on PB Wolf or I can't <laughs> wait on Col. I can't wait. I didn't want to hit yeah. up Col because Coleman was like a like a big like an uncle to me. So yeah. I'm like. I didn't want to hit up Coleman and ask him to connect me. I just, I'm yeah. like, you know what? The best way for me to do what I want to do in life is like, I just got to start do my it. own shit. Let's do it. You know? And then here we are. So that's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, right? Yeah. Like, you never know. Like, who, and I'm sure what's funny is like, there's so many emails coming in for a selection about people wanting to get involved. Now, I, I wish I could offer yeah. them all intern spots, but right. it's really tough. And, and, I, and I'm sure those people are doing the same thing that, you exactly. know, that, that yeah, I did. did. Yeah, man. It's crazy. I mean, um, I threw my demo tape at the Beastie Boys in 1987 <laughs> like, when they were on stage, and I think I hit one of them. <laughs> oh, shit. <It's laughs> and funny. then I ended up, like, opening for them, like, years later, you know? And, like, yeah, it's a rewarding feeling, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I feel like there's there's just so much. A few years ago, you had stated that, um, I think it was 2015, there was an article, and you said, don't, if you could, don't start a record label. What, what exactly did you mean by that? I might have been having a bad day. I, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I like talking. I don't know. I don't know if I can swear, yeah, yeah, but yeah, I like talking. Talking out of your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Uh, no, but I mean, yeah. I think. Um, I mean, I love having a label, though. I, yeah, I really do. Me too. I, I love it, and we're only six years in, and I can't wait to see where we're at. at you know, a deck. You know, four years from now, when we hit our ten years. Yeah. Uh, what's been? What's your perspective though on where things are? Obviously. You see, obviously, you're very music driven. It's not about it's not a number game for you because obviously, yeah. um, you know, you're able to do a lot of different things with artists and and give them that platform no matter what their album sales are, what right. their streams are. But exactly. you see people obviously like Chance, and, and you kind of see yeah. you've been watching this all shift, and it went from downloads and mixtapes, you know, being our friends because, yeah. like you said, I mean, it, Drake it, wrapped over donuts. Like yeah, he was trying to start it, out, exactly, so. and and. and even if people were bootlegging albums off of Stone's Throw, people were coming out to those shows or buying merch, you know? Right. And, uh, but now it's all about streams and someone like Chance has kind of really like broken the barrier. Like what's your perspective on all that now? With streaming or? It's, yeah, streaming and just like how, you know, ki you know, kids and the younger generation, they go through, you know, you could put out the next No Worries album, you know, today. Yeah. And then like, tomorrow or two days they're on you, you know they're what's already going on kind yeah, of already it's exactly. like easier to like yeah to get that instant feedback even just reading like youtube comments or whatever like it yeah yeah because i guess before i mean you're putting records out I, well you would see like if you go to a show and people have the records for you to sign or whatever but um yeah i mean i i'm totally like cool with streaming and, and all that like like I said, like we're still, you know, we're still a, a business that's thriving yeah. and stuff, even though the physical s sales have gone down. And like, I, I personally like physical, like yeah. big records and little yeah. records and all that. But, yeah. um, you know, it's not for everybody. So, yeah. Well, like we were talking about, you, you have to do a lot to, to stay in business because, yeah, people stop buying albums. So streaming, it is a thing. And people, yeah. everyone's a curator. Everyone's playlisting now. Right. And so you have, you know, your your day-to-day -day listener who's doing that. But I think for someone like Stone Store or Selection to survive, you have to you have to sell merch. Yeah. You have to put out those the, the vinyl records and you have do to shows. Um, do shows. <laughs> and I know you guys did a festival um, out in Highland yeah. Park, you know, yeah. um, what was it last summer or in, in it was uh fall? yeah november yeah yeah and yeah. Com common was like i believe the headline yeah and, but yeah you have to do all those things in order for us to survive man is there anything on a last note to someone who's starting their own label or, or musical collective that you would like like to leave them with in order to, to survive and just don't start a label <laughs> no i don't know right back to it <laughs> 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 well, man, it, streaming only label <laughs> for sure. It's, it's been amazing, like just hearing your perspective on everything. And um, as always, let's get right to this music. What can we What can we expect right now from your from your set? Oh well, I just decided I wanted to do like more soulful stuff. Like um, you know, I mean, Stone's Throw is all many different things, but I, I wanted to kind of cater to your audience and your sound and stuff too. Like get the soulfulness. So. Okay, well, that's where it comes from, anyways. Yeah, <laughs> it does. All right, man. Well, thank you again. Uh, we gotta. Re we we should. It'd be dope to really do something together in the future, or I don't Let know. Let me we'll know. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'll, yeah. Let's exchange info and stuff. Yeah, we'll exchange contacts, and uh, 
here we go man thank you again it's, it's really dope to have you here absolutely and i know the, the world has been wanting to see us like chop it up so once again peanut butter wolf is about to step up with an exclusive set here on selection keep it locked don't go nowhere all right